I certainly covet your prayers as I attempt to bring this message on the family trait. Look up in verse 20 of Mark chapter 3. And the multitude cometh together again, so they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, and my marginal reading says his kinsmen, his brothers and his sisters, his near family, when they heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, he's beside himself. His brothers and sisters, he had them. Uh, look in Mark chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? <laughs> I can feel the contempt they say it with. The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon. He mentions four of his brothers and are not his sisters here with us. And they were offended at him. So we see that he had a large family. I think it's... Um, Interesting that, if that's the right word, that the Roman Catholic Church says that Mary remained a sinless virgin after that uh, she had the Lord and that she never sinned, and the scriptures contradict that. They contradict it. They speak of his brothers and sisters. Now, Mary was a virgin when the Holy Spirit conceived the Christ in her womb, and I I can't help but think about what Joseph must have thought when she told him, I'm with child from the Holy Ghost. Uh, you can be sure that he was very incredulous toward that, and he thought to put her away, but she was a virgin. You see, the one that she conceived didn't have Adam's sinful nature. Aren't you thankful for that? Holy she was a sinner like you and I, and she had other children after the Christ. And I think it's interesting, though, when his brothers and sisters saw the multitudes, they tried to get him away from this. They sought to lay hold of him and say, he's beside himself. He's gone crazy. What really hits me about that is these people grew up with holiness in their house. And they didn't see it. They didn't recognize it. Do you know the natural man is incapable of recognizing a holy life? They couldn't see it. They thought he had gone crazy. Now look in verse 31 of the same chapter, Mark chapter 3. There came then his brethren and his mother. Standing without, sent unto him, calling him. Now, I believe that this was on the very same day. If you look at uh, Matthew's account, this appears to have been the same day. And now his mother is included. I really don't think she was there at this initial uh, reading we had when his brethren came because she knew who he was. She knew who he was. But now here she is with them. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without this crowded room where he was preaching, they sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude said about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. Now, there wasn't anybody who loved their mother like the Lord loved his mother. I have no doubt he's the infinitely the greatest son. You think of the way he took care of her even on the cross. Oh, how the Lord loved his mother. He subjected himself to her. But look what he says. And he answered them saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which said about him, these people who were listening to him preach, 
And he said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. These people are my true family. This is the true holy family. You know, where I was growing up in Ashland, Kentucky, the uh, Catholic school was called Holy Family. I never really gave it that much thought, but here's the true Holy Family. My mother and my brethren. And then he gives the family trait. And as much as we are thankful for these earthly families, you know they will not exist in heaven. There's only one family. The family of God. They're not husbands and wives and so on. Just one family. The family of God. And here is the family trait. For whosoever shall do the will of God. The same is my brother and my sister and my mother. The family trait is doing the will of God. Now I hope by the end of this message we'll understand what it means to do the will of God. There's a lot of different things that might come up into our mind, but what is it to do the will of God? God is a person. Yes, <laughs> he's eternal. He never had a beginning, he'll never have an end. He's infinite. He's not bound by space or time the way we are. We can't be two places at once and we can't see what's going to happen tomorrow. He does. He's independent. He has no needs. Isn't that glorious to think about? He's omnipotent. He has the power to do whatever he's pleased to do. He's omniscient. He's never learned anything. He knows everything. He's sovereign. His will is always done. He's immutable. He can't change. Me and you change from second to second. Not him. He's always the same. He's absolutely just. There's no injustice in him. He's long-suffering. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's good. I love that scripture. God is love. Don't you love that? God is love. Not here's love and God fits that description. God is love. And God is a person and all persons have a will. All persons have a will. A will is what you want. A will is what you desire. Now I want a trouble-free life. Do you? I'd love to have no trials. I'd love for everything to be easy for me. I'd like for everybody to like me. I'd like everything to go my way. That is my will. That's what I want. There's only one problem with what I want. I don't have the power to make it come to pass. I can want it, and I do want it. I've got a will, but I can't make it come to pass. Now, the difference between God's will and everybody else's will is he has the power to make it come to pass. Whatever he wills, that's what he does. It's called the sovereignty of God. He has a will. He has the ability or the power to make his will come to pass. And he always does make his will come to pass whatsoever the Lord pleased that did he he doeth according to his will in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him what doest thou he worketh all things after the counsel of his own will and everything that takes place is his will being done. I love the scripture, Proverbs 19, 21. There are many devices in a man's heart. 
Many plans, many schemes, many intentions. I want to do this. I want to do that. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. That's a good verse to commit to memory. There are many devices, many plans, many purposes in the heart of man. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand and that lets us know that God is completely sovereign over the free and uncoerced actions of men. And do I have to go past the cross to prove that? Men did what they wanted to do. I love that scripture in Acts chapter 4, verses 27 and 28. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Everything they did to the Lord in wickedness, it was God's will being done. Everything. And everything is God's will being done. I love what um, Joseph said. You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. Now his will of decree. Listen to this carefully. I hope this makes sense. His will of decree is always done. Always. His will of command is never done. And that is used by God for the accomplishments of his purpose. Thus God's will is always done. Even when his will of command is broken and disregarded, and there's no excuse for that, no excuse for that. God's will of command is, a, is in the Ten Commandments. That's his will of command. Even though his will of command is always broken, he uses every one of the breakings of his will for his own sovereign purpose and glory. That's how glorious this God is. Oh, the will of God. Now, there's some people who do his will willingly. There are some people who do his will unwillingly, but they all do his will. Amen? This is who God is. This is all a part of all things working together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. But when the Lord points out this family trait, doing the will of God, it's doing the will of God willingly. Now, the devil does the will of God. Everything he does is directed by God. I love thinking this. I, I don't want to have anything to say, want to have anything to do with him, but I love this. He's God's devil, doing God's will on God's chain. And everything he does is used for the glory of God. But this family trait... Is people who do his will willingly. If I'm not one of his people that do this, I'm not in the family. The family trait is doing his will. Now Christ said in John chapter 4, verse 34, My meat and my drink is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. In his great high priestly prayer, he said, I have glorified thee on earth, I finished the work that thou gavest me to do. When he was in Gethsemane's garden and he's presented that cup, and when he saw that cup, the scripture says he sweat great drops of blood. He knew the what was in that cup, 
In that cup was the sins of his people, which he was going to take in his own body on the tree. And looking at that cup, I don't understand this. Of course I don't understand it. He does. And he said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I love to think of his cry from the cross. It's finished. He began, or the first thing we have him saying publicly is, I must be about my father's business. And he said, it is finished. Mission accomplished. Now regarding God's will, the Lord said this in John chapter 6, verses 38 through 40. He said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will of him that sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. But raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the Son, you see, he is the Son, and believeth on him, should not perish, but I'll raise him up again at the last day. Turn with me for a moment to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. This is a quotation from Psalm 40, verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it's written of me. Now, he's not talking about the scriptures there. He's talking about the book of God's decrees. He's talking about that book that uh, only the line of the tribe of Judah could open in Revelation chapter 5. No one else could open it. This is talking about God's purposes and decrees. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It's written of me to do thy will. O oh God, above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will. O oh God, he taketh away the first, that first covenant, that he may establish the second by the which will. By God's will, that will he came to do. By the which will. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now look at the supremacy of his will in our salvation. By his will, we are sanctified, declared by God to be holy once for all. That means it's something that can't be repeated. It's already finished. It's a completed act by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Christ. Now, he did his father's will perfectly, didn't he? I love the scripture, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. When he said it is finished, they were saved from their sins. He did his father's will. Now, the Lord speaks of those people who comprise his true family as those who do the Father's will. Every one of them, without exception, if I'm one of his children, if I'm in this holy family, that he would call my mother and my brethren and my sisters, I'm somebody who does his will. Would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 7 for a moment? Verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. Now the repetition of the name Lord like that, Lord, Lord, is they're saying, Lord, Lord, you know me. You know me. I'm the one who did this. I'm the one who did that. I'm the one who has the Credentials. Lord, Lord, you know me. You know me. Lord, Lord, 
Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many, verse 22, many. Now these are the Lord's words, and he's talking about judgment day. Look in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 7. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. Now those are the Lord's words. This is not a cult leader's words. These are the Lord's words. And he says on judgment day, verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils. What spiritual power you gave us. And in thy name we've done many wonderful works. The quantity, many. The quality, wonderful. And they really believe this. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. I never loved you. I never saw you as one who believed on me. I never saw you to trust me only as your righteousness before God. I never knew you to glory in the cross. I never knew you. Now, he knew who they were. He knew all about them. But he says, I never knew you. You're not one of those who was foreknown. Whom he did foreknow. You're not one of them. And look what he says next. He says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, they had plenty of religious works. And, I mean, they preached in his name. They demonstrated spiritual power. They cast out demons in his name. And I'm not saying they didn't. And they had many wonderful works but they never did that one work they never did the will of God turn with me to John chapter 6 beginning in verse 25 this is after the Lord had fed 5,000, and then he left. And they went looking for him, verse 25, and when they'd found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, not because of any conviction of my person, but because you did eat of the loaves And we're filled. Now I love the way he says this to these people who he knows are going to walk away from him. At the end of this chapter, every one of these people walk away from him. And he's only left with the twelve. But look how he speaks to them. We can learn something from this. He says to these people, labor not for the meat which perisheth. For that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. If you labor for this meat, you'll be given this meat. Now, that's what he says. He knew that they would walk away. But if you labor for this meat, you'll be given this meat. Verse 28, Then said they unto him, They heard him use that word labor, and they thought about what they needed to do. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, this 
is the work of God that you believe on him whom he hath sent. What comes after that? Period. Do you want to understand what it is to do the will of God? To believe on him whom he hath sent. Do you believe the Father sent him? Do you believe he was before he was sent? The eternal Son of God and the Father sent him. Do you believe he did what the Father sent him to do? Do you believe that when he said it is finished, he had completed the work the Father sent him to do? Do you believe that he is the sent Savior? Do you believe that he's the sitting Savior? When he by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's the sitting Savior. Nothing for him to do. He doesn't need to walk back and forth and wring his hands and worry about things. He's the sitting Savior. He is the successful Savior. Do you believe that? Do you believe he's the successful Savior? Do you believe he's the sovereign Savior? The one who controls everything. My dear friends, that's doing his will. Believing on him whom he hath sent. Now what if I put in an and? What have I done? I've denied everything I've said. Turn to Acts chapter 16. This is the story of the Philippian jailer after the Lord has opened up the prison with an earthquake and he thought everybody was getting ready to escape and he was getting ready to kill himself. And Paul said, do thyself no harm. We're all still here. And he sprang in. And what did he say? Verse 29, and then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, he didn't say, sirs, what must I do to save myself? Because he knew that was impossible. But he's asking a very important question. What must I do to be saved? And Paul didn't answer and say, you shouldn't be talking like that. That's like salvation by works. You can't do anything to be saved. He didn't say that, did he? He said, believe. On the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He didn't say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and turn from all your sins and get your life straightened out. He said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now if there's ever a time to... Find out exactly what I must do. Here it is. What must I do? Believe. Believe on the Lord. He's the Lord. I, he's the Lord. He's the Lord of creation. He's the Lord of providence. And he's the Lord of salvation. He's Jesus, the Savior. He's God's Christ, God's prophet, God's priest, and God's king. And Paul didn't say Anything else, did he? He didn't say anything else. 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's to believe on him whom he has sent. It's to believe on his name. Believing on the name. That's the person behind the name. That's all of his attributes. I'm trusting his attributes. I'm calling upon his attributes to save me. Save me by an act of your sovereign will. Save me by your justice. Save me by your grace. Save me by your power. Save me by your wisdom. That's what it is to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now these people in Matthew chapter 7, they had plenty of works, didn't they? But they didn't have the one work. One thing is needful. Turn to John chapter 7. Verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? He never went to seminary anywhere. He didn't have any education. What's he doing trying to teach us? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. You'd find it an interesting study to look up every time where the Lord talked about being sent. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Now, if any man will do his will. There it is. If any man will do his will. He shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. You know, if you don't know the doctrine, you know what it is? You're unwilling to do his will. All error is caused by this, an unwillingness to do his will. If any man will do his will, he'll know the doctrine. Whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. You know, if you hear a preacher preaching and you leave thinking, well, I wish I could be more like him. You know why? He's seeking his own glory. That's it. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true and no unrighteousness is in him. Now, you know how you can tell whether something is of God? Very simple. Who gets the glory? Now, I've said this recently. I'm going to say it again. There's two reasons why I want Christ to have all the glory. Number one, because he deserves it all. Number two, because if he doesn't get all the glory, that means something's expected out of me. There's something I need to do, and that's a burden I don't want to face in any way. I love him getting all the glory because he deserves it all, and that makes my salvation safe and secure. He did it all. Somebody is thinking, are there not other commandments to keep? Are there not exhortations to obedience? Did not the Lord say, he that keepeth my commandments... The same as he that loveth me? Should we not try to keep the Ten Commandments? I don't try to keep the Ten Commandments. I've kept them. I've kept them perfectly. They look me over and say there's no fault in him. He's kept me perfectly. You know, there's something about trying to keep the commandments. Something's wrong with that. Something's wrong with that picture. If you try, you didn't do it. Well, I'm trying my best. Your best ain't any good. But I've kept the Ten Commandments and I love them. And the scriptures are filled with exhortations to obedience. I wouldn't deny that for a second. I love this one. These things write unto you that you sin not. 
when you do. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I love when the Lord says to John, love not the world. That's an exhortation to obedience. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man that loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. It's an exhortation to obedience. Love not the world. Love not the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Hate them in your heart. Ask for deliverance from them. But what are the commandments that you actually keep? Don't say any of the Ten Commandments because you're deceived if you think you've kept one of them one time. All you demonstrate by that is you don't understand the holy law of God. You don't understand God's holiness, nor do you understand your own sinfulness. If you think you've kept one commandment one time, you are blind to yourself and to the holiness of God's law. Are you saying it's okay to break it? We shouldn't try. Quit saying that. Quit saying that. I love God's law. I delight in the law of God after the inner man. And I'm not afraid of God's law. I stand perfect before God's law. I've kept it in Christ. But I know in myself, I haven't kept it one time. Not one commandment, not one time. Well, what commandments do you keep? Turn to 1 John chapter 3. Verse 23. And this is his commandment. That we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And love one another as he gave us commandment. Now let me tell you a commandment that I keep. It's only by grace, but I do this. Right now, I'm believing on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. He is my salvation. I'm relying only on him. I'm keeping that commandment. Me, I'm doing it. I know it's only by the grace of God, but I'm doing it. God, the Holy Spirit, didn't believe him for me. He's causing me to believe. And you know what? He says, love one another. If somebody loves Jesus Christ, I love that person. Don't you? Somebody that loves Christ, that's the excellence of the earth. That's the, oh, I love them. I do. And so does every other believer. Now, this is the family trait. Doing the will of God. Now, let me make this statement in conclusion. Doing the will of God and believing on Christ are one and the same thing. This is the family trait. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in Christ's name that every single one of us might do the will of God, for Christ's sake. In his name we pray, amen. Matt, come lead us in closing hymn, please.